There's a Scooby Doo monster. All we need to do is dream, and a rainbow will come out and capture people, and <laughs> Correct. we can take their stuff. Okay, you guys, today we got something a little different and a lot of fun over at the Goosh, our Patreon. My pal Gimster sponsored a couple episodes of videos done by the fat electrician. Well, immediately, you know, I felt sympathetic being not an electrician, but definitely fat. These were so much better than I ever would have imagined. Th these videos are interesting as hell and just so well put together. I mean, he he tells you these stories and, and gives you these details in such a professional and easy to listen to. I, mean, I, I was just blown away by it. It was just really that good. So uh, Gimster was cool with us bringing that reaction over here. I thought maybe you guys would like to share share it along with us now. If you haven't heard of The Fat Electrician, of course, the links to the videos that we're reacting to here will be in the description. Make sure to go over to his channel and check him out. And if you are familiar with him, come on and watch along with me as, as I discover him because this is really, really good stuff. I already know the name Desmond Doss, and even more of you would remember it if I reminded you that he was the conscientious objector in World War II that refused to carry a weapon into combat, despite oh, that he I... saved 75 men at Hacksaw Ridge as a medic. But what almost none of you have heard I... of is the I experimental unit that he was that part of. Story. Today we're talking about the 77th Infantry Division, aka the Old Bastards. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you realize it or not, we've all been exposed to the concept that you should never underestimate the old guy because sometimes <laughs> he just might be a complete badass. We see it everywhere. There's yeah. memes and commonly held sayings all over the internet Mr. like exuberance is no match for old age and treachery or beware an old man in a profession by being where young dumb. men die. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, in <laughs> pop culture and TV, there are characters in pretty much every show and every movie that are the embodiment of this sentiment and they are more often than not the fan favorite that everybody loves. On Nickelodeon, That's Kids there. channel, That's you true. see characters like Uncle Iroh. Good old King Uncle Boomy. Iroh. In anime, you see characters like Master Roshi. In more and adult Roshi. shows, you've got characters like Mike from Breaking Bad. Lord I like all these characters. I got respect for this guy. From Game of Thrones. Characters like this are everywhere in pop culture, and they are catered Great to the age group because it is never too early to learn the simple concept of be careful because that old man just might whoop your fucking ass. And I bring all this up because it raises <laughs> one simple good. question. If old men really are such badasses and experience is truly such a valuable asset, what would happen if you made an entire army out of old guys? Well, we don't have to wonder because in World War II, America did just that and the results speak hmm, for themselves. This is we're interesting. We're get into it right after a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Henson's Shaving. Okay, here's the deal. I Henson's did not know this. a machine shop that makes parts for the aerospace industry. This, There's literally parts this on the Mars rover that these guys made. And one day they woke <clears> up and they're like, hey, we're just going to make guys. the most precise safety razor on the market. And this is it. This Henson's is all they sell. It comes shaving. in aluminum or titanium. If you want to pay extra, it comes with a little stain. And then they also sell the razor blades so you have a one-stop shop. Not because their razor blades are proprietary, because this thing will take any shaving razor blade on the market. You don't have to buy their proprietary cartridge. You don't have to sign up. It's funny for, for shaving my head. Thing. No, you buy this one time and then you can put any five cent razor in it and shave for the rest of your life. So the product itself is fantastic, I, but more importantly, I the buy, company is buy awesome the because cheapest every time razor blades out like there. This, they get sent a little media packet. Not to save money point, because they're the only say, ones that work well for me. Say, the more so expensive ones slice me up for some reason. But the brief that I got for Henson's basically said there is no script. Do whatever you want. We trust you. Also, in the first paragraph, they said this, quote, if for whatever reason you don't get a good shave with our product, please let us know. If we can't help you, then don't endorse us. We think we've made one of the very best razors in the world. If you disagree, we'd rather not ask you for a non-genuine endorsement. So the razor is the type of company like that you that. actually want to give your money to. I'm going to have a link for them down below. Let's get back to the video. Very cool. Okay, here's the deal. I've been making Stand up American company. history videos on the internet for about two years now, and without fail, every single time I make a video about America and World War II, I get this exact keyboard warrior in the comment section. Oh, no. Buh! America didn't win World War II. They showed up late and tried to take credit for it. Buh! Okay, look, on one hand, I want to give this a serious answer. There's no American that's saying America won World War II all by yeah. themselves. Nobody mm, is saying I, I've it never heard anyone team effort claim by the that. Big three, America, the UK, and the USSR, as well as a bunch of other countries that were occupied 
occupied or close to being occupied, they all made humongous sacrifices to win World War II. It right. was a massive team effort. So when an American says America won World War II, they're simply saying the Allied forces won. America is part of the Allied forces. Therefore, I, I agree America with them. I've never won. heard anybody claim that we did it by like ourselves. That would be, be stupid. a factually correct statement to say that the USSR and the UK also won World War II. On the other hand, if we're talking shit, I can do that too, because guess what? When it comes to World Wars, America's the MVP. I hate to break it to you, but let's just face facts here. Too. If World War III breaks out tomorrow and we're picking teams by lining all the countries up on the wall like it's <laughs> dodgeball in gym class, guess who's getting picked first? <laughs> yeah. America. If you disagree with yeah. that, it's because you're being disingenuous or you're fucking dumb. And the whole America showed up late to World War II thing, look, number one this guy delivers well. a buy. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Furthermore, it's not like World War II was on the verge of ending and America popped in at the last second so they could be on the winning team, okay? World War II ended because America came off the fucking top rope with air oh, carriers, tanks, and atomic bombs. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting horribly sidetracked. I apologize. The point I'm trying to get to is that there's a lot of people on the internet that like to say America showed up late to World War II. There's a lot of people on the internet that like to like say anything choice. mindless for attention. Option, because in 1939, when World War II kicked off, America didn't really have a military to go fight with. Okay, let me break this down for you. 16 million Americans served in the military in World War II, and at its peak, the U.S. military had 12 million people actively serving in it. In 1939, wow. when World War II started, America's military had 200,000 people in the Army and 100,000 people in the Navy. To put that into perspective, <clears throat> America had the 19th largest military on the planet, and 18th was Portugal, which is approximately the size of Indiana, which is one of America's 50 states. If that wasn't bad enough, not only was the American military small, it also just wasn't very good at this point in time either. They were so underfunded that the American military only had 329 light tanks that were outdated and 1,800 aircraft that were also outdated okay. and if that wasn't bad wow enough, i did not, not know did not have any of this and there wasn't very many of them they didn't really know how to fight either because america hadn't revisited its battle doctrine since world war one meaning the only fight that america knew how to participate in was trench warfare which was right. not what world war ii was so if america wants to have a meaningful impact in world Excuse war ii me, they're going to have to rebuild an entire military from the ground up both physically and conceptually so the american government and the american hmm. military got to work on this right away in 1939 because they knew america was going to have to participate in this war whether the public wanted to or not and hint the american public wanted absolutely nothing to do with world war ii from 1939 through 1941 at this point in time the american right. public very much viewed world war ii as a european conflict as, yeah i was just gonna say as an overseas issue with, and they wanted nothing to do with it despite that the united states government started to institute a draft in october of 1940 forcing young men into the military to grow its military size just in case. Fast forward about a year, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor the yep. cardinal sin of fucking with America's boats, essentially flipping the American public sentiment of we don't want to be involved to cowabunga it is. In less than 24 <laughs> hours on December 8th, 1941, well, well the American said. government, Congress, has cowabunga, motherfucker. war on Japan. <laughs> Three days after that, December 11th, Hitler declares war on America, at which point all of America is pretty much like, I mean, you didn't touch the boats, but fuck it, you can get some too. <laughs> it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. In the yeah. days and weeks and months following uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, not spoiler, only hundreds of thousands of young men volunteered to join the United States military, but the draft would ramp up as well. The army was growing so much so fast that they were activating and standing up new divisions left and right, one after another. And by March of 1942, these new divisions that were being stood up were almost entirely comprised of draftees. They had some officers and some NCOs that were assigned to stand up the entire division but aside from that all of the new guys that were coming in were all untrained new recruits right. that were drafted. Raw. One of these first Greeners. all drafty divisions was the 77th Infantry Division. Now, I need you to understand how absolutely crazy this situation is. Standing up a new division is a humongous undertaking, okay? A military unit I'm of sure. that size, that's like 15,000 men. That is a living, breathing entity, okay? There's history, there's standard operating procedures, there's leadership, there's a way of doing things, and that way has probably been written in blood for years by the men that came before you and you're just popping one up overnight. Okay, that's <laughs> fucking crazy. Okay, let me explain this in a hypothetical so hopefully you can understand a little bit better, okay? Imagine that you showed up to work tomorrow. Let's say that you, you worked on an assembly line for Ford and you're building F-150s and you showed up to work and they gave you and a couple of your buddies that you work with keys and they're like, hey, drive across town, 
there's a big ass empty building and go start go a new factory and start another manufacturing yeah. plant. there's no machines figure out the machine gotcha. you need figure out what order they need to go in figure out the new fucking car that you're gonna build and figure out all of this shit how you're gonna pay everybody taxes everything figure all of it out by the way the new workforce is coming in next week none of them are fucking trained you have to go ahead and train them on all the shit that you get them up to speed out yet. Good luck. excuse me and if sorry that guys wasn't hard enough the 77th infantry division <laughs> was a guinea pig division it was literally an experiment you see the high-ranking military and the government oh, were great. concerned and they didn't know what it was going to take to win world war ii and they didn't know if they had enough young men 18 19 20 21 22 23 what if all of those young men got taken out and we needed to rely on the older generation of men to go fight this war they needed to know what these older men in their 30s and 40s and 50s would be capable of physically doing on the battlefield and they needed to get that data now right, so that they had it in the future makes sense. they need it so when they comprised the 77th infantry division they basically gave them all of the old guys okay the average age of a draftee in 1942 wow. was 23 years old the average age of somebody in the 77th id was 33 years old and bear in mind that's the average the oldest new recruit i could find in the 77th infantry division was 53 years old Jesus and he was a world Christ. war one veteran and some of you are probably like yeah 53 is pretty old but 33 isn't that old at all why are you making a big deal about this okay look as far as joining the military at the age of 33 that's ancient that's almost yeah. unheard of i mean think yep. about it you can join the military at 17 years old be done and have 20 years in service with a full pension at 37 38 years old and these guys are joining at 33. at 33 i mean when i went yeah. to basic and ait the oldest guy we had was my buddy flores he was 28 years old and everybody called him gray bush the wise so the point i'm trying to get across <laughs> to you is like yeah it's really weird to join the military that late in life gray also, bush the wise oh good, kind of weird that's sad for because it points out just how old ever, i am came up to them and asked them, hey <laughs> if you had to go off to war and you could either go with a platoon of 18 year old kids or a platoon of 30 year old men everybody's picking the 30 year old men a hundred percent of the time because you got to realize when these 18 19 20 year old new recruits are coming in for training half the battle is having the army the drill instructors come in and teach these kids all the life lessons that mommy and daddy never got around to right. while they were growing up as kids they don't have to do that with a bunch of 30 year old men these guys have been out in the real they've, world they, yeah they've, years they've years learned their, their life lessons by life and eating shit sandwiches they're already with the program so the 77th ID shows up to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. That's 16 weeks and then another 12 weeks for their advanced training, which for most of them is just going to be infantry. And they absolutely crush it. They show up and there's very little like disciplinary or life lessons being handed out by the drill right, sergeants. Right, so they can because, get well, right down to business. most of the drill sergeants. It's literally a bunch <laughs> of middle-aged men showing up being like, okay, I'm here. Show me what I got to do to not die. And then whenever somebody was being an asshole, they would police themselves. Like one of the new recruits is being a dick. All the other new recruits would handle that issue internally before it even got to the drill sergeants because they wanted everybody squared away so fast forward two months they are on week eight out of the that sounds like a wrestling training, locker and they room are head and shoulders above all the other new training divisions they are the best division they have they are so good that when winston churchill came over from england halfway through their basic training they were the unit that was selected to do a parade for winston churchill to show off how badass the american army was going to be and here's wow. what winston churchill had to say about it quote the faces of the men gave me the greatest and everlasting memory of the day i have never been more impressed than i was with the bearing of the men whom i saw the undemonstrative therefore grim determination of the newly drafted bodies bodes ill for our, for our enemies. enemies wow so well this said experimental guinea this pig is cool of old guys is absolutely crushing it they go on let's go old guys training i don't have the exact stats but it is documented that a disproportionately high amount of all of the 77th infantry qualified as expert with the m1 grand right out of basic training from there they go and they do their 12 weeks of advanced training and they do a great job at that too at this point upper military is kind of looking at these guys like okay well this is this is actually kind of working let's see what these old guys can really do so they send them down to louisiana for eight weeks and they're going to do a war game the 77th id going up against another new division that just got stood up full of 23 year olds literally the old guys versus the new guys <laughs> versus, <laughs> versus old age sounds like a wrestling we're going to have a legit script war game and see who outperforms the other. And when Excuse I tell me. you the 77th ID whooped that other division's fucking ass, it is a complete understatement. Oh my god, I almost died! <laughs> I almost died! Because <laughs> at this point, it's winter in Louisiana. It's going to be good. cold at night, especially considering they're not allowed to have tents and they're not allowed to have fires. They're just out there sleeping on the ground for two months doing this war game going force against force. So, naturally, the 77th ID wants to play the mental warfare game and 
and ruin it right out of the gate for these young kids. So bearing in mind that it's winter and everybody's going to be cold at night, the 77th launches a bunch of very aggressive ambush attacks, basically pinning the other force between them and a river, and they just keep advancing closer and closer until the other division is forced to cross the Excuse river me. on foot, getting oh, all of their oh, shit oh. completely soaked. Oh, oh, like, oh, oh. A little bit wet. Who nice cares? Trust move. me, if you were living outside for two months and every possession that you owned to your name was on your back in a backpack and you weren't allowed to have a tent or fire to dry your clothes and all your shit just got soaked, you would care. Okay, there's nothing worse than walking <laughs> around for 16 yeah, hours really. holding a gun with a heavy backpack on and the only comfort you get at the end of the day is some dehydrated food and the opportunity to change out your wet socks for more wet socks. Okay, whether you believe me or not, I just need you to trust me. It's going to take a mental toll on some 18, oh, 19, 20 year old kids. There's no me. question. Like from there, it only gets like a thousand times. Take a mental toll on anybody. This, but you got to remember, these are middle aged men, okay? These are dudes that are working construction jobs in the 1940s before OSHA was around. Walking around on yeah. high beams with no harnesses, <laughs> eating lunch, and nobody gives a shit. You got dudes that were working in offices before they had an HR department, okay? These guys are bringing so much workplace pranks and tomfoolery to the table. <laughs> these 20 year olds aren't going to know what hit them. So, one of the big things the 77 does is they start pretending to be in this other division at night like they'll roll up at night there's like one guy left awake you know pulling guard duty whatever they'll roll up to him and be like hey uh commander so and so whatever the fuck said i need to take this jeep and go take it over to hq blah 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 and he's like, oh okay cool yeah whatever man he like nods back off and the he's it. supposed to be on guard 77th id guy just steals their jeep i mean strategically transfers it to a different location like they're stealing <laughs> all their vehicles they're stealing all their equipment and then you know usually when you're doing military stuff you want to sever enemies <laughs> communications so they can't communicate at all not the 77th id no we've got fucking jimmy who worked for the phone company for 10 years we're gonna find the enemy <laughs> communication lines we're gonna tap into them and then we're just gonna start just gonna listen. bad intel to make complete fucking <clears throat> chaos behind enemy lines and then all the boys are going to gather around the radio at night and we're all going to listen to the higher ups in their chain of command complain about how poorly they're performing. <laughs> <laughs> At the conclusion of this war game, the 77th ID has just completely outclassed this other division full of young men, and it really starts to raise some like it. because now people really want to know what these old guys are physically capable of doing. Camp Hyder. This is where it goes from being kind of fun to not fun at all for the 77th ID because the real experiments are about to begin. They send the entire 77th to a place called Camp Hyder. It's about 100 miles outside of Phoenix, Arizona, in the middle of the desert. So oh, they yay. Show up to Camp Hyder, it's literally just the desert with a couple of tents, not even enough tents for the entire division. They have to go and dig their own wells to find their own water. And then, because they didn't have enough tents, they're out there literally building mud huts to live in. So after they get done, literally building Building Jesus an army base from Christ. scratch, the army comes along and they're like, hey, we want to know how far a normal dude can march in the desert in 100 degree heat if we only give him one quart of water. So here's what you guys are going to do. We're going to force you to march and you're just going to keep marching until a certain number of you pass out. That way, we'll have a really good idea of how far a single dude can go on one quart of water. So this is already boring yeah, that's fun. and unusual punishment, but it doesn't stop there because after they figure out Being how far a guy can subjects. go on a single quart of water, they decide that they're going to start having six-day exercises where they have the second lieutenant, the lowest-ranking officer that presumably knows the least, guide a platoon of men through the desert for six days straight. And if they want to be able to get their next day's supply of water and food, they have to be in the right place at the right time at the end of the day. Holy Otherwise, shit. they just don't get the food and water. You thirsty, Stanley? Okay, they're literally doing some Hunger Games shit <laughs> with their own troops. And for those of you uh, who don't know, it's literally a running the joke. The Clipsy inserts are, are perfect. suck at land navigation and Spot always on. get lost. There's literally men that die from exposure and dehydration during this period at Camp Hyde the 77th Infantry Division. <clears throat> this goes on Excuse for six me. months that the 77th is out in the middle of the desert having experiments run on them. And after that six-month period came to an end and they got orders saying they were going to move on to some other type of training, they decided that in true military fashion, they were going to put this behind them by utilizing a dark sense of humor. The joke was that their time in the desert was just as shitty as actually going to war, so they came up with their own medal, the Hyder Campaign Medal, to commemorate their time in the desert that they would all wear on their uniforms as a joke. The ribbon of the medal was made out of a piece of sandpaper, and the medal itself was a broken thermometer. And to absolutely nobody's surprise, the War Department decided that they were not going to officially recognize the Hyder Campaign Medal. <laughs> the entire unit is now being shipped back over to Pennsylvania, where they are going to have one month of 
advanced rifle marksmanship training, despite the fact that most of them already qualified as experts. As expert, so they go, they right. do that, they get even better at shooting than they already were, and then after that, the army comes out and they're like, hey, I've got this new sub-zero temperature sleeping bag that I want to have tested, so we're going to take you guys, our guinea pig division, we're going to send you over to West Virginia, have you go up in the yeah, mountains the with this pigs. new sleeping bag, no tents, no fires, I just want you to live there for a month, hang out, freezing your ass off, and just sleep in these sleeping bags at night, and if you guys survive, we'll know they work. Okay, good, see you in a month. <laughs> That seems Why fair. Are you the way that you are. So yeah. they, you know, they do that. They freeze their balls off for a month. They climb back Who knows back why Toby mountain, was? Why he was like, hey, guess was. what? It's uh, early 1944. We've decided that we don't need you guys for D-Day. You're not going to be going over to the European theater. We're actually going to send you over to the Pacific to help out the Marine Corps. So next step of your training, you're going to head over to Virginia, and you guys are going to train for a month doing amphibious landings in winter in the Atlantic Ocean. But oh, yay. News, you're already cold. Damn. So have fun so hey, yeah they they he should be used to like this shit by now they now they're headed off to hawaii <laughs> where they're going to go through jungle warfare training for six weeks now this is probably the most important training the 77th is going to get considering that they're going into war in the pacific theater up against the japanese in a jungle environment and the mm -hmm. japanese are presumably already masters of their own environment and pretty much everybody in the 77th is hyper aware of this and it makes them take this chunk of training that much more serious and one of the things that they notice is when they show up to jungle warfare school there's the archway that they walk through it says jungle warfare school and it's got the tagline below it in quotes it says if they don't stink stick them which is obviously referring to what you're supposed to do with your bayonet if you come across an enemy's corpse that isn't decomposing that isn't de because right. at this point in time it was highly likely that that person wasn't actually dead and they were pretending to be dead or hurt so that they could ambush they you could, and right. I mean, that's one of the right. big lessons that the 77th took to heart that makes this sense of training for reasons that we're going to find out in a little bit so they finished really up for school and that's it. well They're told off story the here Pacific theater after over two years of training in multiple different climates in multiple different terrains all over the United States spanning over the course of two years this unit that is now on average 35 years old is headed to war so July 1944 they show up and they're going to be helping the Marine Corps with the Mariana wow. Islands campaign this is a Marine Corps operation they are running the show and the man in charge is the Marine Corps General Holland Howling Mad Smith and he has not been very impressed with the army's performance so far helping him with the first island in the mariana islands campaign saipan during the battle of saipan general smith was so unimpressed with the 27th id's performance that he actually had their general relieved of command and had a wow. corps general placed in charge of an army division so general smith is already not thinking very highly Ooh, of the army's shit. Capabilities, and when he finds yeah. out that he is being reinforced with the 77th id a guinea pig that's harsh that is comprised mostly of middle-aged men he's not very happy about it so they're getting ready to invade Guam, and General Smith's plan is to not send in the 77th Infantry Division as a singular fighting unit. He's going to split them up and basically use them for reinforcements. Like, if this unit over there lost a platoon, he's just going to take a platoon from the 77th, give it you to guys those guys over fill there, in. and yeah. he's basically going to disband and piecemeal out the entire division, is his plan. And that's exactly what happens. <clears> for the amphibious landing on Guam, they take some of the 77th ID platoons, they give them out to some of the Marine Corps units, some of the other Army divisions, and they send them into battle. A couple days later, General Smith Smith, wondering how the old guys are doing, writes out to his commanders like, hey, how are these old guys performing? Can we use more of them? What's the deal? And to General Smith's surprise, according to all of his leaders in the field, these old dudes can throw down. They're absolutely awesome. A Marine Battalion <laughs> commander even went so far as to say, and I quote, there is no doubt in our minds that the 77th were good people to have alongside in a fight. As a result, we started referring to them as the 77th Marine, Marine Division. Division. Okay, wow. First, I need you guys to really appreciate what just wow. got said here. Okay. Wow, Marine that's Corps, big. I love them, but they're not good at a whole lot. Really, if I were the commander in chief, I wouldn't call up the Marine Corps unless I wanted something dead, broken, or pregnant. That's really where they shine. That's their <laughs> wheelhouse. You want to know what the Marines are? aren't good at giving compliments Dead, to broken, other people. They're, or pregnant. Just, they're not about it, okay? So for the Marine Corps to look <laughs> over at the 77th ID guys, a bunch of middle-aged army dudes killing people in battle and go, you're one of us. That's the best compliment the Marines yeah, know I how get to give, that. okay? It's a, it's a huge deal. I this is the equivalent that. of the Jedi Council giving you a seat on the council and giving you the rank <laughs> of master. This is unprecedented. <laughs> Likely, the council does not. You're on this council. We grant you the rank of master. What? Take what? a seat, master Skywalker. What? So when General what? Howling Mad Smith reads this, he's like, damn, okay, well, if one of my battalion <clears throat> commanders thinks that these are Marines, 
I'm going to treat them like Marines. I'm not piecing out the 77th Infantry Division one platoon at a time anymore. I'm going to send in the entire division on the Marines right flank. So pretty much immediately the entire 77th Infantry Division is sent in and they make an amphibious landing on the beach on the Marines right flank. 15,000 middle-aged men from the East Coast wow. up in amphibious tractors getting out with M1 Grands and Tommy guns ready to fuck shit up. This is the metaphorical equivalent of dad getting home from work. The Japanese just don't know it yet. And this amphibious <laughs> landing and their movement... They don't know Dad just pulled into the driveway. Absolutely textbook. <laughs> it was the epitome of slow is smooth and smooth is fast. It was the least chaotic amphibious landing anybody had ever seen. And as all this is going on, the Navy and some seagoing Marines are watching this amphibious landing take place. And a seagoing Marine famously says, Would you look at those old bastards go? Officially christening them with That's their the new old nickname. the old bastards the old bastards now the battle of guam rages on for about two more weeks until the island is secured on august 10th 1944 and at the conclusion of this battle it becomes clear to absolutely everyone including general howling mad smith that his battalion commander was correct about the <laughs> and they are because badasses the past two weeks of the battle of guam <laughs> the old bastards have racked up 2741 confirmed kills and sustained only 248 in return okay that is a ratio of 11 to 1 one going up against an enemy that has home field advantage and the luxury of playing defense from fortified machine gun positions which wow. is absolutely insane and with a performance like that their new monikers of the old bastards and the 77th marines are pretty much set in stone with even general holland howling mad smith himself referring to them as such Holy crap. Their incredible All your islands are belong to us. <laughs> some rest and relaxation in New Caledonia, so they hop in the boats and head there immediately. They get about halfway there, and then the big green weenie strikes. Change of plans. No more R&R. &R. We're going to turn the boats around and head straight over to the Philippines, because in Leyte, MacArthur has four divisions, and they are completely stalled out, and they need the old bastard's help. Now, the Japanese government has pretty much come out and said that they are going to make the Battle of Leyte a decisive battle for this war, and for that reason, they are throwing all the resources Forces and manpower they have to win this battle against America and not lose this island. And up until this point, they're doing a great job. And then the 77th show up. <laughs> they show up to Lake hey, Thanksgiving Kick Day the door down. with the energy of Dad didn't get to take his nap, and now it's going to be fucking everybody's Oh, problem. and everybody's okay, going to pay. Version of what's going on here. The Americans have one half of the island. The Japanese have the other. The Americans are getting resupplied on their back end, and the Japanese are getting resupplied on their back end from a place called Ormok Bay. So the 77th Infantry is like, that's fine. Hear me out. We'll hop in the boats. We'll drive around Leyte, make an amphibious landing, and we'll take over Ormok Bay, cut off their supplies. Game over. We win. To which the chain of command is like, that's absolutely crazy. You're going to be outnumbered three to one, and we're not going to be able to get you any more supplies. To which the 77th is like, that's fine. We'll just Who bring some supplies shit? with us, and then we'll steal all the enemy <laughs> shit. And as far as being outnumbered three to one, we've been hanging out with the Marines this entire time. And if they've taught us anything, that's just a target rich environment. Let's fucking run. That's so a target forward, rich environment. Environment. Well said. <laughs> ID makes an amphibious landing in Ormok Bay. They catch the Japanese completely off guard, take over the entire thing, get their entire division into the bay oh, in man. 35 minutes. Then they start bringing in artillery and M10 tank destroyers. So they get everything squared away. They establish a defensive perimeter, also known as a beachhead. Then first thing tomorrow, bright and early, they're going to start kicking ass, right? Right. Everything's great. Couple hours later, guess who shows up? A Japanese landing ship full of Japanese troops not having gotten the memo that America runs Ormok Bay now. So oh, the bastards oh, under the cover oh, of oh. Night game, all of the artillery and the M10 tank destroyer at this ship as it gets closer and closer, getting ready to offload its barges full of troops and more supplies. The ship gets as close as it's going to get. It sends out its first barge, and the old bastards just wait patiently as the barge gets closer and closer. And as wow. it gets within 50 feet of them, they open fire with the 50 caliber machine guns, pretty much sinking it immediately as the man on top of the M10 tank destroyer yells out, Get some flares in the air so I can hit these sons of bitches. As the flares get shot up, the enemy ship is illuminated as the artillery and the M10 open fire on it, sinking it in a matter of minutes. According to the 77th Army's historian, this is believed Jeez. to be the only time in World War II history where an infantry unit has successfully sunk an enemy naval vessel. So they're already <laughs> off to a great start. And what happens next is described by an observer from the War Department as a divisional epic. Over the course of the next divisional eight weeks, epic. the 77th goes well on said. an absolute 
absolute rampage, <laughs> taking over three cities, an airfield, and securing 43 miles of main supply chain roads, okay? It's not a big island. There's not that many roads. They've basically taken over all of them. And the entire time they're doing this, they are acquiring enemy supplies. Everything from food to vehicles, and anything they don't use, they destroy. And they're not just out there stealing all the enemy shit. They're out there giving out death certificates like they're Oprah Winfrey giving out cars, <laughs> because during this period, they are credited with 19,456 confirmed kills. In return, they suffered 543 Americans killed in action. That's a lot. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way, but it needs to be said that that is a 36 to 1 ratio. Okay, 19,000 to 500 is an ass whooping and a half. And yeah, this but, be studied at Fort Benning and like you say, you don't want to diminish it. Program That's how years you win a war. A clinical, Hands down. textbook level ass whooping. This two month long rampage would bring an end to the Battle of Leyte with America securing the island and the 77th would immediately be shipped over to begin preparations for the Battle of Okinawa. So yeah. they get to the staging area no for rest the for the Okinawa, weary. At which point they are informed that there is a small island chain known as the Karamaretto Islands. It is 15 miles off the coast of Okinawa, and the chain of command believes that they are going to be of strategic importance, and the 77th has to go clear them out. Now, the Karamaretto Islands is made up of four main islands, and the old bastards decide that they're going to take me. all four of them at once because apparently <laughs> they're in a hurry. So that's what they do. They launch an amphibious landing on all four <laughs> islands hurry. at the exact same time. Some of the islands they take over <laughs> with zero resistance whatsoever and the other islands they face very very little resistance and for a second it was so easy that they were kind of thinking maybe they just wasted a bunch of time and resources capturing these islands anyways but upon further investigation what they found was a fleet of 360 hastily made boats that were filled to the brim with explosives wow. that the Japanese were going to use in a kamikaze, kamikaze style attack but instead of planes they were going to be driving explosive boats directly into American ships during the main invasion of Okinawa. So being able to wow. from using these weapons during the invasion of Okinawa made this entire mission completely worth it. Do oh, you think? Holy shit. Fast forward a couple of days, April 1st, 1945, Easter Sunday, the Battle of Okinawa begins. It is two Marine divisions and four Army divisions making the initial landing, and the 77th is not one of them. They are being held back in reserve. And just to be clear, they're not being held in reserve because the chain of command thinks that they're the second string backup guys. They're being held in reserve because they have the reputation of being the problem solvers, and they want to save the 77th until they diagnose where the real I would say they're definitely at, problem they're solvers. The 77th shit. In, then. Pretty much immediately after the invasion of Okinawa, it becomes very clear to the chain of command that they missed a nearby airfield. There is a small island neighboring Okinawa known as Lishima, and on that island there is a Japanese airfield, and that airfield needs to go away. Problem is, that airfield is being guarded by 5,000 Japanese soldiers that are very well dug in, <laughs> and they are not about to give up without a fight. So. They send in the 77. Guess who gets to go take care of business? Of it, securing the entire island of Lishima in six days with none of the Japanese willing to surrender. Virtually all of them were killed in combat. Approximately 5,000 enemy soldiers with the 77th losing 258 men in return. And while the old bastards are securing Lishima, the Battle of Okinawa is Jesus. still raging on. It is one of the bloodiest, most hard fought battles in American history. The island is being guarded by over 100,000 Japanese soldiers with hundreds of heavy artillery pieces, thousands of more order positions and fortified machine gun positions they have the high ground and they have underground tunnel networks this entire battle is a fucking meat grinder the entire island of okinawa is an enormous problem and nobody is having a good time but one of the most problematic areas is a hundred foot high cliff face where the 96th infantry division has been absolutely wow. shredded this place is known as the escarpment or as it would later become known as hacksaw ridge the old battle oh, okay. sent in to do what the 96th Infantry Division couldn't pull off. As they show up, they send two battalions up the 100 foot high cliff face to engage the enemy. The Japanese drove both battalions back, forcing all of them to retreat. All of them, except for one. One of the youngest old bastards, a 26 year old medic by the name of Desmond Doss, who was unique in that he refused to carry a weapon into battle because he was a conscientious objector that didn't want to hurt anybody. He only wanted to save people. He stayed up top hmm. while everybody else retreated. And while evading the enemy, he managed to go around and find wounded Americans and begin lowering them down the cliff face all through the remainder of that day and all through the night. By the next morning, he had single-handedly lowered shit. 75 men down a 100-foot cliff face, saving all of them. 
The next day, the 77th would attack again, this time sending up one battalion wow. to engage the enemy and the other battalion out and around stunning. the side to flank them. During this battle, Desmond Doss would become mortally wounded by grenade shrapnel and sniper fire. While wounded, he continued to insist that the other medics and litter bearers continue to save other men rather than himself. The old bastards would finally take the ridge, killing over 3,500 Japanese soldiers and losing over 600 men of their own. But amongst them was not Desmond Doss. The men of the 77th got Doss evacuated in time. He would survive and eventually go on to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at hmm. Hacksaw Ridge. But as his journey in World War wow. II came to an end, the old bastard still had work to do. Now the 77th is going to be sent to capture Shiri Castle, but in order to do that, they have to punch through the this Shiri This is amazing, this story. It's a natural wall of hills and cliffs, and on top of them is 50,000 Japanese soldiers manning fortified machine gun positions with overlapping fields of fire. At this point, almost all of the American forces Yay. are stopped in their tracks somewhere along this line. Two Marine divisions and another Army division, both stuck unable to penetrate through the spot where the 77th have to break through to get to shiri castle is approximately half a mile wide and two miles in length it takes them 32 days of constant fighting Damn. to clear that two miles during those 32 days and in that single plot of land the japanese forces suffered 14,000 men killed in action all of the american divisions managed to break through the shiri line around the same time and the battle of okinawa would rage on for a little bit longer but the shiri line breaking was the last major defensive maneuver mm -hmm. that the Japanese were able to do. Everything after that was small scale skirmishes and this would rapidly bring about an end to the Battle of Okinawa. After Okinawa had been secured the 77th would receive word that they are to be shipped back to the Philippines. Probably shouldn't uh, be retooled, bomb Pearl Harbor. And receive Just a saying. bunch of new guys to replace the men that they had lost and they are going to be the only combat unit that was present in the Battle of Okinawa that is also to partake <clears throat> in the first wave of the invasion of mainland Japan. Which is probably the shittiest compliment imaginable hey you guys did such a great job that you get to do it again, again. luckily however yeah. after arriving to the philippine island of cebu the 77th id would receive word that america had utilized a new type of weapon by dropping <laughs> an atomic bomb on yeah. hiroshima and nagasaki forcing the japanese to surrender and they would not have to go and invade the mainland of japan this is yeah, that, news, but that it left just one thing convention to hurry to he had to do before they could finally be done with home. the fight. You see, all throughout the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and the rest of the Pacific, there were still Japanese military members all over the place, scattered pretty much everywhere. Many of these groups of Japanese soldiers would refuse to surrender for months, or in some cases, even years or decades, refusing to believe that the Japanese Empire God would damn. ever surrender. And in the case of Cebu, where the 77th currently were, up in the mountains, there were approximately 5,500 Japanese soldiers. Fortunately, they were willing to surrender because they got orders directly from the emperor unfortunately they were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards bear in mind we're back in the philippines these <laughs> japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains in cebu <laughs> are the remnants of what was left after the battle of leyte when the 77th went on a two month long rampage destroying everything <laughs> now to be fair we don't know for sure why these guys were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards maybe it was because they remembered a bunch of middle-aged men with a blue statue of liberty patch on their shoulder whooping their ass and they just didn't want to surrender to them or i i have a I have an alternative theory. You see, along this entire journey, the 77th has not only gained a reputation for being extremely effective in combat, but they've also gained a reputation for kind of, sort of, not really taking a whole lot of prisoners compared to everybody else. Now, bear in mind, this is the Imperial Japanese. Not many of these guys got taken as prisoner because they would rather die in combat than lose their honor by surrendering. Despite that, out of all the POWs that were taken, the 77th somehow managed to take on the least. You know what? Let me just read you guys the stats and you can come to your own conclusions. Of all of the Pacific theater across all branches of the U.S. military, approximately 50,000 Japanese POWs were taken. That is a ratio of 44 to 1. For every 40 45 enemy soldiers that the American forces came up against, 44 of them were killed in action, and, and one, one would be... was taken prisoner. The right. 77th Infantry Division, on the other hand, only managed to take 358 POWs, which is a ratio of 122 <laughs> to 1. And it gets way worse if you want to talk about the Battle of Okinawa in particular. Oh, During shit. the Battle of Okinawa, all of the U.S. forces combined took a total of 10,801 Japanese prisoners of war. That is a 10 to 1 ratio. Of those 10,801 POWs taken by the U.S. forces at the Battle of Okinawa, the 77th ID was responsible for... 58 of them at a ratio of 
278 to, to one, 1 compared to Jesus the US on forces ratio of 10 to 1. That and might be why Jones, they had a no idea why it's boner like for Perhaps them. Perhaps it's because the old bastards displayed exceptional rifle marksmanship. Maybe it's the fact that they took the jungle warfare lesson of if they don't stink, stick them to heart, and they followed through with that throughout the entire war. Either way, the fact of the matter is they've developed the reputation that they don't really take prisoners, and now there's 5,500 Japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains that are too scared to surrender to the 77th ID, and they need them to surrender so that they can finally go home and mow their lawn after like four years. You always start before everyone wakes up, including roosters. <laughs> what the? Hey, shut up! You shut up! So the leadership of the 77th sends it up the chain of command. Hey, you're going to have to get some other unit out here to accept this surrender because they're willing to surrender to anybody except for us. To which the big army is like, just fuck it, figure it out. No, I'm not sending another group of guys out there. Get them to surrender one way or the other. Make it happen. Chop, chop. Hurry up. Now, the obvious answer is to just practice classic American diplomacy where you show up with a gun and a sandwich and ask them which one they would prefer and let them know that both is an option. <laughs> the old bastards, on the other hand, have an even better idea. They are going to close the oh, saga no. out the same way they opened it up by pulling some schoolyard bullshit and tomfoolery. So here's what they come up with. A lot of the new reinforcements that they were getting weren't old guys anymore. It was just whoever the army had. So it was 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. So they right. took them, had them take the blue Statue of Liberty 77th ID patches off their uniform and they're going to send them up the mountain, have the Japanese surrender to them, separate them from their guns right there and march them down the mountain. So that's exactly what happens. They start marching the Japanese down the mountain. Japanese are happy because they've gotten to surrender to literally anybody except the old the guys 77? with the blue Statue of Liberty patch on their shoulder. And then they get to the bottom of the mountain where there's a bunch of old guys with the Statue of Liberty patch on their shoulder. So the Japanese promptly shit their pants thinking that they're all about to die, at which point the 77th is like, look, calm down. We don't we don't care. We're not going to hurt you. I just need you guys to get on the boats so we can ship you off to wherever the army wants you so that we can then get on our boats and we can go home because we're sick of this shit. And that's what happens. That's it. The 77th goes back home. The unit gets deactivated and everybody lives happily ever after. So in conclusion, that is a story of the 77th That's Infantry an amazing Division, AKA story. Well the done. Old bastards. A bunch of middle-aged men are well done. Is nothing more than a bunch of guinea pigs whose only meaningful contribution to the war effort could be to collect data points and run yeah. experiments. That, on yeah, them, I was just going to say just go guinea pigs. Become one of the most effective fighting forces the world had ever seen. They saw combat in the Pacific Theater for 11 months and during that time they would Excuse lose 2100 men, but for every old bastard that fell on the battlefield, he would take with him 20 two enemies. The Jesus 77th was credited Christ. with 43,651 confirmed kills during this time period. They were the busiest army division in the Pacific Theater and they were the only army division that was declared to be Marines by the Marine Corps. Yeah, this, really. The members of the 77th were awarded six medals of honor, 19 distinguished service crosses, two distinguished service medals, 335 silver stars, 22 legions of merit, 25 soldier medals, 4,433 bronze stars and 16 distinguished unit citations. Holy Thank you for watching. Best way to support shit. the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. That was good. Wow. I. Oh. Seriously, this is one of the best stories and one of the funnest things that I've ever got to research. That being said, for some reason, once I found out that pretty much all these guys were from the East Coast, the only thing I could picture in my head was that all 15,000 of these dudes were rich high. You know, angry cops here from YouTube. <laughs> it's one of the most terrifying thoughts I've ever had in my entire life. Just 15,000 angry drill sergeants storming up the beach. <laughs> Just a bunch of pissed off old guys. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like and he said it well who just want to go home and mow their lawn <laughs> and you assholes are in the way of them doing it that was a great story amazing story so now this one is called i told you the doom turtle america's only super heavy tank sometimes i like to read several books get in contact with that the that was really cool i had no idea about video and other times pretty much everything in that story and rant about some stuff that i think is funny and by sometimes i mean i mean today right now Okay, that's right. fair. Today we're talking about my favorite tank, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> America's me. only super heavy tank, the T-28, a.k.a. the Doom Turtle. 
It's a unique look. Now, I said this is my favorite tank, which is a completely unquantifiable metric. Despite that, somebody in the comments is still going to tell me that I'm wrong. So, if you think I should have a different favorite tank, go ahead and tell me about it in the comments below, and maybe I'll do a video about that one, too. Okay, and just to be clear, when it comes to me and things like tanks and planes and guns, favorite is not the best, it's not the most impactful, it's not the most historically relevant, it's just the coolest slash dumbest one around, and in my opinion, this is it. So let's go ahead and get into this right after an awkwardly relevant word from our sponsors. This video is brought to you by War Thunder. They've got over 2,500 tanks, planes, and ships, pretty much every military vehicle from World War II until modern times, including all the cool, weird, and obscure ones that may have never even actually seen combat. For example, guy is an excellent to researcher, AKA writer, the Doom Turtle, America's only and super heavy tank. I can do that. Then I can go over to x ray mode, look at all the different components, of check information. out all the specs, actually <laughs> learn about the tank. Then I can hop over and I can cut really easy to listen to. Let's face it, I don't just want to be the Doom Turtle. I want to be the Doom Turtle covered in bushes so I can try to sneak up on the enemy like I'm a 200,000 pound Wiley Coyote with a 105 millimeter <laughs> howitzer for a nose. Then we throw an American flag on one side and some smack talk on the other and now we're ready to go play the game. Now once we start playing, the cool part is that it's not like a lot of other games where you just shoot at the other enemy tank and a hit is a hit no matter where it lands. No, yeah. in War Thunder you can take out individual components of the enemy tank. For example, oh, that's let's cool. say there was a guy on a mobile artillery piece and that one guy in particular was talking and smack you can address him individually or maybe you're approaching an enemy tank and you fire but your <laughs> shell doesn't get penetration and now it takes a while to reload so you just open fire with your 50 cal right through the window slit giving their driver a nice metallic face high five then once you get the gun reloaded you can finish taking out the rest face, of the crew five. or sometimes you just get right. that lucky shot where the shell goes straight <laughs> his through the phraseology is perfect <laughs> and the best part about all this is that it's free to play on pc playstation and xbox so if you want to give it a try we'll have a link and a discount code in the description down below and when you use my link you're going to get all kinds of freebies to get you started off on the right foot let's get back to the video all right the doom turtle it is a world war ii era tank that was designed for one reason and one reason only and that is to punch through the german siegfried line if you don't ah. know the siegfried line is germany's western border where they have essentially tried to fortify it to make it impenetrable to the allied forces approaching so that they can't break into germany it is approximately 400 miles of concrete pyramids known as dragon's teeth making it so tanks and other allied vehicles can't pass through then all right inside of the dragon's teeth you typically had other things that were meant to stop foot soldiers like moats barbed wire booby traps and on the other side of those was over 18,000 bunkers with machine gun, mortar, and artillery positions that were going to, in theory, God be able damn. to mow down any ally trying to advance through those obstacles. Now, the American military and government knew about the Siegfried Line pretty much the entire time because German propaganda told them about it and they portrayed it as completely impenetrable. <laughs> America probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So the American so, military in 1943 you're, you're throwing down the gauntlet. The Siegfried line eventually. You're Let's challenging me. A plan in the works on how we're going to address it once we get there. Now, clearly, that plan should not rely on tanks, right? I mean, that's kind of the Siegfried line's entire mo. It was right, designed, that's what it was designed to stop. Implemented with the sole purpose of stopping tanks. We should probably do anything other than use tanks, right? Wrong, completely wrong. American engineers got told the Germans built an impenetrable tank fortification, and they're like, "Fucking bet, we'll see about that. We're gonna build a bigger, <laughs> better tank that's gonna drive right fucking through it." <laughs> Fuck yeah. So the engineers got to work. This is called the AT project, and what they came up with was surely there's spots along the Siegfried Line where the German military has a gap where they can drive their vehicles through, right? has to be there they can't just have 400 miles and they drive all the way around there's got to be points where you can pass through it and obviously those points of passage are going to be the most fortified positions right they're essentially going to make a fatal <clears throat> funnel a choke point where all of the allied forces have to try to go through a narrow passageway and on the other side it's going to be loaded with german 88 anti-tank guns german artillery machine guns mortars everything they're going to be able to slaughter anybody that tries to yeah, make right. it through that little tiny like narrow passage because you're funneling right into like, their cool, obvious solution teeth. we're just going to make a tank that can't die okay it's going to be so heavily armored that there's no anti-tank weapon or artillery piece known to man that could kill it then we're going to put a gun on it that's so big that it can shoot through concrete bunkers and take out the enemy we're literally going to drive this gigantic heavily armored tank directly into the enemy choke point stand there take all their anti-tank fire be Excuse untouchable me. and then we're going to return fire and kill them first okay do you understand how gangster that is this yeah is, this is the ultimate gangster would maneuver. be the word Just straight up like i know exactly what you're plan is i know what you want me to do so that you can beat me i'm gonna do it anyways and i'm still gonna win because fuck you so they made the new turtle the t-28 <laughs> america's only super heavy tank <laughs> this thing is 36 feet long 10 feet tall and 14 feet wide it has 12 inches Damn. of armor on the front and it's weighing in at 95 tons K 
pay approximately 210,000 pounds. Christ. And the human mind can't comprehend how heavy this tank actually is. It literally weighs as much as a blue whale, which also isn't helpful because most people haven't seen a blue haven't whale. Seen, right, so it's like, right. there's my calculator. Toyota Corolla is like 3,000 pounds. Okay, it's like 70 Toyota Corollas, okay? This entire <laughs> thing is like an entire parking lot got a gun strapped to it, and now it's coming to kill the enemy. Speaking of gun, they went with a 105 millimeter gun, okay? That is field grade artillery. This is literally a howitzer that they strapped to the front of this metallic blue whale. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you this thing is basically the Norwal of death, all right? Which raises the question why on earth did they go with the Doom Turtle and not the Norwal of death? Well, well, it's because this thing's slow as shit, which is really the downfall of this tank because somebody basically said, hey, we're going to build a 200,000 Yeah, how fast tank, could it possibly be? We're going to put be? the same V8 engine in it that the M4 Shermans have. Ooh. Yeah, the Doom Turtle is rocking a 500 horsepower V8 Ford engine, okay? Just for the record, if you don't know much about engines or horsepower, Dodge is out here making minivans with a 1,000 horsepower yeah. that weigh 5,000 pounds, <laughs> and the DOD <laughs> thought it would be a good idea to stick a 500 horsepower <laughs> oh. V8 inside of a tank that weighs as much as a blue whale okay the doom turtle is coming at Yikes. you to speed a mock potato pedal to the metal balls to the wall this thing maxes out at eight miles an hour so clearly they're gonna have to transport this thing all the way to the siegfried line right if they land this thing on a beach in normandy and let it drive all the way across <laughs> france it's gonna take like three years to get there and this is actually why the doom turtle has a unique everybody in the tank will have retired by then two very wide sets of tracks like a normal super heavy tank would and that's because those two outermost tracks come off and separate from the doom turtle allowing it to be easier to transport both because now the Doom Turtle isn't as wide and it comes apart in three separate chunks, making it all weigh significantly less than the original 95 tons. So they've got it all figured out. And by 1945, they start manufacturing these things. Originally, they're planning on making 25 of them. They figure that'll be enough to punch through the Siegfried line, but they build two prototypes first. So they get those prototypes built. Then they're testing the first one and the V8 engine that's trying to move 200,000 pounds obviously catches fire, burns out the entire inside of the tank. The entire thing is essentially a total loss. And while that was going on, the allied forces managed to penetrate the Siegfried line. How on earth did they do that without the Doom Turtle, you ask? Well, A, the Siegfried line wasn't really all it was cracked up to be, according to the German propaganda. It definitely was not impenetrable. It was undermanned. It just wasn't as good as it was made out to be. So oh, they just shit. Went and they sent out recon and they found live up to the hype. where they weren't well covered by like artillery and machine guns and booby traps and then they just put a bulldozer out and pushed dirt over the top of the dragon's teeth and then drove right over the top got behind enemy lines and oh took everybody shit out. yeah the germans spent god knows how much money and man hours building this 400 mile stretch of concrete booby traps and they got outdone by a couple of rednecks with a bulldozer <laughs> so because of that the doom turtle simply just wasn't needed anymore so they stopped the project one surviving prototype they gave that over to aberdeen proving Ground and they use that basically as a giant weight to test transportation equipment because well it was the heaviest tank they had and if it could move the doom turtle it could move it anything could move else anything, so right. they used it for that for a little while then one day somebody just parked it in a field and everybody forgot about it after that people start asking questions historians the public museums like hey where's that badass tank we want to preserve it we want to save it it's a part of history we want to stick it in our museum let me have it so i can take care of it and the army is like I don't know, bro. We lost it. Okay, now on one hand, to be fair, I'm pretty sure I know exactly how this happened. They just like had a couple of dudes go park it. They made it take all day. They parked it off in a field. Those dudes like retired. They left. They moved on. And then nobody remembered where it got. Where it went. Okay, like I'm sympathetic to that. I understand how it happened. But on the other hand, how the fuck do you lose a 200,000 pound tank that there's only one of? Like I would understand if you were like, oh, hey, we misplaced a Sherman tank because America made like 50,000 right, of Right, because there's right? plenty, but no, plenty more. this isn't a Sherman tank. It's <laughs> twice the size of a Sherman tank and there's only one of them, okay? You could park it in so a it's never lot found? full of tanks and you would still be able to find it. How on earth did you manage to lose a blue whale with a gun attached to it, okay? Dude, where's my car? Ah. Uh, See, where's my car? So that's it. It's just gone. It's MIA for the next 27 years. Nobody oh, okay. has any clue where this thing is at. And then one day, some hunter is out in the woods near a military base hunting. And he's like, hey, there's a fucking tank sticking out of those bushes. <laughs> Dude, there's your car. Yeah, you guys thought I was being silly earlier with that War Thunder ad, didn't you? When I stuck a couple of bushes on this giant tank and pretended like that was going to conceal it. Well, 
history is on my side now because this bitch was incognito for 27 years because it had a couple of bushes the, because of the bushes now. so the hunter goes to the army he's like hey i found this weird looking tank in the bushes and they're like oh shit we've been looking for that thing so the army then takes the tank they give it to a museum in fort knox so it's on display there for a little while and then they decide that they're going to move it from fort knox to fort benning or fort more freedom whatever the fuck it's supposed to be called now the home of the infantry they decide they're going to move it to the infantry museum at the home of the infantry so they throw it on the het trailer the heavy equipment trailer and they tow it all the way to Georgia. While they're towing it there, apparently they take a turn too hard and it breaks the chains off the het trailer no. and the entire main cab of the tank flies into the ditch. Now granted, it was just the main cab of the Doom Turtle, so it didn't have the two outermost tracks, which is like a significant amount of weight, but still the main cab is 60 tons flying off your trailer into the ditch so that's uh. terrifying obviously the doom turtle completely fine the paint got scuffed no big deal get it back on the trailer they get it where it's going now here's my issue i know for a fact that there are pictures of the doom turtle in a ditch somewhere in georgia i yeah, need those some, pictures Someone somebody has them somebody's got to have phone. them this happened in like 2017 2018 2019 somewhere around there i know one of the drivers in that convoy took a picture had to snap pictures it has to have happened i want that picture for history so i can get it to the museum okay Get me that picture. What are you waiting for? Chinese New Year? Go, go, go. Sorry. So that's it. That's that's the end of the story. They get it to the National Infantry Museum, and that is where it is on display today. So in conclusion, that's my favorite tank for literally no reason other the than it's Doom completely ridiculous, turtle. and I think it's funny. Literally from that is funny, though. just designed to be a giant middle finger. The enemy told America, <laughs> hey, you can't drive your tanks through here, and America said, like, hold my defense you wait and budget see. and watch this shit, hold and my this defense is the monstrosity budget. that they came up with, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you can give a tank steroids or even test a tank for steroids, but if you can test that one first now have it pee in a cup i never saw combat yeah absolutely it's cool to think about if it did however that serves to highlight one of the most important lessons that i teach on this channel and that is that the only thing scarier than engineers and defense contractors with an unlimited budget is a bunch of infantry men on the ground with time on their hands because that's what actually gets shit done thank you for watching best way to support Good the channel stuff. is some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out very good very good. Man, only the government could lose a 200,000 pound tank for 27 years, currently still be missing six nuclear warheads, and then tell me how dark I'm allowed to tint the windows on my car. <laughs> it's got a solid point there. <laughs> Live up to your own standards. Those were good stories. Those were really good, entertaining stories. I, I mean, the 77th, that was fascinating. And the whole Doom Turtle thing was really funny. That's guy's a good storyteller. Put the legs into it. In other words, Tanjiro ain't skipping leg day. <laughs>